Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So first of all, we talk about uh, CCD deformation of uh, two-dimensional integrable quantum field theories. Okay, so let me thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, here about uh, very recent work in progress that I've been carrying on with Sasha, with Thiago, Matelensis, and Giancarlo Camillo in the last few months. Uh, so I will present here some partial results. Uh, there, there is still work to be done and things to be understood on this subject. Um, but things that we found are already nice enough, I think, that can be presented to the audience here. So um, the subject is, um, concerns itself, um, so this work concerns itself with um, a generalization of the TT bar deformation, a certain class of deformations. And the idea behind this work was to understand whether the properties that I will briefly review of the TT bar deformation are unique to that kind of deformation or are shared by a larger class of models. And we found out that they actually are shared. And maybe there are even more particular properties uh, concerning these, uh, these more general deformations. So, uh, what? Here we go. Okay. Um, so, I will briefly review irrelevant deformation and the TT bar deformation, and then I will speak about the properties that are of interest to our work of the TT bar flow. And then I will introduce these generalized. Uh, models, the generalized deformation, and talk about the finite size spectrum and what we have found up to now uh, using the TBA equation. I will present some numerical result and then conclude with some work in progress. So um, let me just very briefly talk about uh, deform irrelevant deformation. So if we consider an action which is close to a renormalization group fixed point, it can usually be expanded uh, with some relevant direction and some relevant operators here. This is a simplified version where I just have one relevant operator and no marginal operator, uh, but everything can be extended to more complicated situations. And I can say from an outset, uh, just by looking at the action that this term here defines a UV complete theory, but as soon as I consider contribution from irrelevance, uh, then the UV completeness is in general shattered. The theory becomes effective with everything that we know. Uh, the perturbative expansion leads to accumulation of divergences. I need an infinite number of counter terms, and the theory is non predictive, is non renormalizable. I can go a, a step further now by using Wilson interpretation and considering the space of quasi local field theories, where each point is uh, labeled by an action, which is an integral of a local density depending on a certain set of fields, fundamental fields, phi and the derivatives. Uh, each of these uh, action is equipped with a UV cutoff, and I allow for some non-local interaction in a range which is smaller than the inverse of this cutoff. And that's the meaning for quasi-local. Now, in this space, the interesting thing is that the renormalization group flows are given by scale transformation. So I, I pick uh, a fundamental length scale in my, in my system, and this, the logarithm defines the renormalization group time. And the renormalization group flow is determined by a vector field, which is an element of the tangent space, which corresponds to the space of fields of my theory at uh, the point L. So this object here is a field of the theory at the, at the renormalization group time L. And the important thing is that the renormalization group trajectories are integral curves of, the, of this first order system of equations. Now we know mathematical, standard mathematical results uh, taken with care because here everything is infinite dimensional, but we know that if we are moving forward in time, so we're looking at large scale, large scale properties and we look into the IR, we don't expect any pathology. But in general, if we were to look at short scale property, so look to the UV, then we do expect pathologies. And here you can think like in Kadanoff, uh, uh, block spin point of view. When you go to the IR, you're integrating out degrees of freedom, so you expect your description to keep being uh, useful. But if you go to the UV, you will need more degrees of freedom, and so you expect your description to break down. In other words, you expect that there exists some time uh, where your action escapes uh, the space of quasi-local field theories. And there is an UV, UV scale, which is intrinsic, and which in QED is the land of scale. Of course, there exists a subset of theories where you can just uh, remove the cutoff consistently. It's a space of UV complete theories. So very quick review. This is a very 
uh, simple pictorial um, representation where you have this blob, which, uh, which is the space sigma, and then a, a very random choice of initial point and vector field will give you a trajectory which escapes and puts you outside where you don't really know what's, what's there. Now, the TT bar deformation is a specific choice of flow dictated by this equation here, and I will introduce TT bar in a moment. Uh, and what's uh, remarkable about this flow is that it is expected to have L star infinity. So it is, it is expected, uh, it appears to be UV complete, but it appears also to lack a proper UV fixed point. And uh, in particular, it appears, it displays a very non-trivial properties in the UV, and this is what makes it interesting. And I will briefly review them now. Let me introduce the TT bar operator, uh, simply defined as a collision limit of this uh, point split determinant of energy momentum tensor. Um, and the point split is necessary in quantum field theory because singularities can arise when these two points coincide. But the fact that you're considering a bilinear operator in the energy momentum tensor, and you know the LP of the energy momentum tensor, the energy momentum tensor is a conserved current, then this uh, allows you to exert a high degree of control on this operator. So much that you can say, for example, using word identities and spectral decomposition, that the one-point function vanishes, the derivative vanishes, so the one-point function is a constant. Mm -hmm and it does factorize into the determinant of one-point functions, which, is very, which are very useful properties. And moreover, using the OP, you have complete control over the singularity that arises in the collision limit. Um, and you can see that the only term that contributes to the expectation value is a contact term. And you can get rid of this in principle by rotating the space of coupling, uh, the basis in the space of coupling. So you have complete control over the quantum properties of, of this operator. Uh, so why, why is it interesting? It has been under a lot of attention in, the, in these last two or three years, and a lot of application have been, uh, have been considered uh, of this deformation. And the main reasons, uh, at least from my point of view, is that its deformation is universal. So any theory where you have an energy momentum tensor can be deformed in this way, which makes it somewhat universal in two dimensions, of course. Uh, and the fact that it's a very high degree of control and it is in some sense integrable, meaning that once you know uh, your observable in your starting theory, then you can, in principle, compute the observables in the deformed theory by using a certain set of equations, so like equations for the spectrum, for the partition function, for this matrix, uh, as I will review in a moment, makes it very, very manageable. And it also preserves existing symmetries. So in some sense, you can look at the TT bar deformation as a way to generate integrable models starting from integrable models, for example. And another property that I didn't write, but is that it preserves, it, it doesn't display level crossing. So levels are just shifted by, by this flow, which is a, another important fact. Some important motivations why this theory is, I mean, there are loads of important motivation and loads of application. I won't review them here. I will just present some motivation, which I find interesting. And the most interesting one to my eyes is the fact that it's, uh, as I mentioned, UV complete, but it's paired with an extremely non-trivial UV behavior. So it displays things like Hagedon transition, non-locality, superluminal propagation in, in the case of one of the signs of the coupling and, and so on. And these, these um, properties are so interesting that the term has been uh, coined by Dubovsky, Gorbenko, and Mirabai. Uh, which is UV fra fragility, which collects the phenomena, uh, uh, which I mentioned here. This should be phenomena, not phenomena. Yeah, you get the point. And one of the one cute application is, uh, which showed that there is some some uh, physical content to this deformation, is that once when, in general, when you consider uh, uh, the scaling limit of a microscopic theory you know that the critical behavior of the theory is described by UV fixed point, and then you get correction, which are given by relevant operators, uh, controlled by relevant operators. And then everything else that's left, uh, all the subleading behavior are controlled by relevant operators. 
So exerting a certain amount of control on these operators and the deformation affected by this operator allows you to compute uh, or at least to fix partly the, the subleading contribution appearing here. So for example, if TT bar was the lowest uh, irrelevant operator, then you could fix these parameters appearing here. This by dimension, the exponent by dimension, and this uh, coefficient by the factorization property of the TT bar, which gives this equation here. And that's a cute application that I thought interesting to mention. Now, the, um, the properties of the TT bar which are relevant to what I'm going to say later are the finite size spectrum. So once you are on a cylinder the, uh, at the energy levels obeys the Burgers equation, which is given here. And the Burgers equation has the property of, of, of having this phenomenon which is called wave breaking. So think of uh, setting P to zero, so considering just a zero momentum sector, what this equation does is to affect an affine transformation on the plane ER. So once you start with a profile, which is the usual grand state profile with some CFT behavior here and some um, uh, bulk energy here, you end up with one of these two situations. Either when alpha is bigger than zero, your energy becomes a constant, run state energy becomes a constant at equal zero, and when alpha is smaller than zero, then you cannot even reach R equals zero because you face a branch point here. And this is the Hagedon transition that I mentioned before. This is the Hagedon radius, which is uh, the inverse of the Hagedon temperature. And this equation was found by Fedor and Smirnov and Sasha Zemolochikov by me, Cavalias and Zeni at the same time. And it can be derived very simply using the factorization property and the identification of the one point function of energy momentum. Now, um, in the zero momentum sector, and in particular for the Brown state, the Burgers equation is equivalent to this functional equation here for the uh, ground state energy, just concentrate on the ground state energy. And this, uh, using the CFT behavior, yields this, uh, this equation, this relation here, which you can then use to say, okay, when alpha is bigger than zero, you have a finite R volume, finite R equals zero limit, which means that the entropy density is the constant too in the vanishing volume, which is an interesting fact. But what I'm going to concentrate on is the alpha less than zero, where you have an agaton temperature, where this, uh, this square root vanishes, and this implies that the entropy density diverges at the rate. And you can also show that the spectrum, the high energy spectrum, displays a Hagedon type behavior of this kind. Instead of being a square root, an exponential of a square root of phi, e, it's an exponential of phi e, controlled by a rate. And this for CFT was shown by Barbone Rabinovici, but it's a general uh, feature also for massive theories. It's, uh, it's of this kind. Okay, now the other property that is interesting is that the S matrix itself satisfies an equation, which is a consequence of the deformation of the action by the TT bar operator. And the, uh, the equation is given by this, was given by Dubosky, Gorbenko, and Mirbaba in 2013, and then was rediscovered in the context of integrable theories by the same set of authors and me that I mentioned before. Uh, and it amounts, as you can see, to taking the, your starting S matrix and dressing it with a CDD factor, which a simple CDD factor which contains this cinch. Uh, it can be shown uh, to be uh, to derive from the action flow by a TBA or a linear integral equation, and you see that it has a gravitational phase shift. And for alpha it's smaller than zero, it's a healthy theory, but it appears to have no local observable. Uh, and for alpha bigger than zero, there is superluminal propagation. But the important thing is that the S matrix is well defined. So you have a well defined object. Now, CDD factors are objects that satisfy automatically the bootstrap equation. So you don't fix them by simply asking bootstrap to be satisfied, but you need to add some minimality assumption. And what you do is that usually you take your, your bound state structure and you ask the poles of your S matrix to, to respect these bound states bound state structure, and then you fix uh, the asymptotic behavior by physical requirements. And these fix you the CDD, in the, which is called minimality prescription. But in principle, you can ask yourself, what happens when I take my S matrix and I dress it with some general CDD? Now for uh, this simple CDD, we know that it's related to TT bar, but what about more general ones? And the most interesting question here is, uh, what is the effect, uh, for example, on the spectrum of having the CDDs multiplying by a minus matrix. And this is the question that we asked ourselves. 
And in particular, we asked ourselves, uh, do the properties of the spectrum change in the same way as they change for DT bar or in more general way? Or uh, we don't know. So that's what we set out to find. So what we are looking at here is uh, instead of multiplying by this simple exponential, we multiply by a more general CDD factor, which can be expanded in Fourier series in general in this form here. And here, secretly, I'm considering the case of the free fermion. So I choose uh, S to be an odd integer. But if you were to consider, I don't know, like the young model or something like that, then S will belong to a more restricted set of integers. Um, I call these factors here, each one of these, an exponential CDD factor. Uh, and I can also write uh, general CDD in another basis, which is the basis of rational CDD factors, which is written like this. Now you see that if you take the sum or this product to be finite, these two representations have different properties. So this one introduces poles, while this one does not. And this one has a simple asymptotic, and this one has a complicated asymptotic. So they have different properties when you look at just a finite amount of uh, terms. And let me mention that uh, I will consider just cases where the poles of this matrix lie outside the physical strip. So I don't have uh, any bounced added bound state to my theory. And starting, as I mentioned, with the free fermion here, I'm starting with just one uh, single particle in the spectrum, and I keep on having just one single particle. I don't want to add any more bound state and any more TDA equation because the situation is complicated enough as it is. Um, so once you have the S matrix, you can study the finite state spectrum by considering the TDA. And as I mentioned, in this case, I just have one equation, but pseudo energy satisfies the usual TDA equation. The energy is given by this formula, where L is the logarithm of one plus e to the minus epsilon. And mu zero is the usual driving term and phi is the logarithmic derivative of the S matrix. An idea is to search for non-trivial behavior. For example, the branch cut that we see in the TT bar case. I will present what I will show later are partial numerical result for the case of two rational CDDs where the, uh, this kernel phi can be written in this form here. And the restriction on gamma reflects uh, the, the choice to have poles outside the physical strip. And this is given by symmetry. OK. So uh, the CDD, the TBA equation, uh, this TBA equation is uh, in this case, uh, and in the cases in general of rational CDD, is way too complicated to solve analytically. On, uh, on the contrary, uh, when you have just one CDD, for example, you end up with a, uh, with a you reduce this integral equation to an algebraic equation. But in this case here, it's too complicated to solve analytically. So you, we use the numerics to study it. And numerics is, as usual, you take the, the driving term as a seed function, you iterate the equation, and everything works uh, well. You start with a large radius, um, and you settle down to a solution to this equation. And then you decrease the radius, and you keep on finding a nice solution until you reach a point uh, decreasing the radius where uh, your routine uh, slows down and at some point it just stops working. And while this might be a numerical problem of the routine that we wrote, we, we tried with various different numerical techniques and we kept on so seeing the same exact phenomenon at the same exact radius. So this is, uh, a minus, uh, well, this is an indication that there might be some kind of singularity. You have a critical slowing down. So it seems like there is a singularity in your, which is, a, a property of the equation itself. So guided by, t, by the TT bar case, uh, we suppose that there might be something like a branch cut uh, going on in, uh, in our equation. And the idea was to, one of the idea was to say, okay, if we have two branches of our solution and the two branches behave differently at infinity, they, then we must see, we must be able to see different uh, R to infinity behavior just starting from this equation. So the idea was to see if, uh, if this um, equation allow for more than one asymptotic behavior. And the various possibilities here are when epsilon is comparable to the driving term, which is the usual situation. When you ask for the, the convolution to be subleading, then epsilon needs to be bigger than zero. Epsilon goes as r cos theta minus exponential correction. And that's the standard asymptotic uh, of the TBA equation. Then you can ask different kind of uh, 
there are different ways of balancing this equation. So for example, epsilon might be subleading, still diverging, but subleading with respect to the driving term. And you see easily that this is an inconsistent uh, uh, super, uh, hypothesis because the driving, uh, the convolution term cannot balance the equation. And similarly, if you ask the equation to make sense for this product to be integrable, then also the case where epsilon goes to a constant in R is inconsistent. The only possibility left is for epsilon to vanish. So in this case, uh, the L term here will not only be independent of R, but will also be independent of, uh, of theta. And in this case, you have a sub 2T because you can ask, uh, while well, you need to ask for this, this product to be integrable, uh, you can ask for phi not to be integrable by itself. And in this case, then there might be a consistent situation because these will diverge in the limits. Yes, thank you. Uh, but I will show that this is possible only if you consider in TT bar uh, the formation. Uh, and the last possibility is to balance the equation by asking both of epsilon and the convolution term to be uh, of the same order. And as mentioned here, this is only possible when epsilon is smaller than zero in a certain subset of the real line. And this subset needs to be compact because you want, because if not, uh, everything will just uh, divert without making sense. Uh, but if this is a compact subset, then you have the situation here. You have two subcases, so either both of them diverge faster than the driving term, and then you have two functions that control your asymptotic. This is goes faster than f, and these satisfy two equations. And by Fredholm alternative, uh, you see that this function h, in order for both equations to be true at the same time, h needs to be zero. And so you're left with the last possibility, which is epsilon going again. Uh, to infinity as r by being negative in a certain subset theta. And this function f, which controls the asymptotic, is given by this equation here and by this uh, positivity uh, required. Now, you can see immediately that here, this is possible only you know, for, for some choice of phi. For example, if phi was to be negative everywhere, uh, then this equation won't make sense because you will have that f needs to be positive, but it's a sum of negative terms. So this is not possible. So this case is only possible if phi is either mixed sign or positive uh, everywhere. So let me review briefly the various cases. This is the standard asymptotic. Uh, the other asymptotic when epsilon vanishes in the limit and phi is not integrable is only possible in TT bar. And you can see it because the structure of TBA imposes epsilon to be of this form. And then you just substitute in the convolution term, you substitute the integration variable and you end up with this dependence. And then when you put gamma equal one, the equation is balanced and everything works out. But if you do the same for higher exponential CDDs, then you find out that it's impossible to balance the equation. So this is not a viable possibility as I from TT bar. The last case on the other hand, it's possible only if phi has not a definite sign, as I mentioned, or if it is everywhere positive, and on top of that, it satisfies this bound here. So the, the L1 norm of phi needs to be bigger than one. And you can see it very easily because you simply bound the convolution term by the maximum of the function, and you see that you end up with this relation here. And now this is interesting, this is important because this excludes uh, this, for example, Sinch Gordon from this case. Sinch Gordon kernel is everywhere positive, but its L1 norm is one. So this is not a possible case for Sinch Gordon, and we are just left with case one, which is what we expect. But in our case, in the kernel that I showed you before, this kernel here, uh, the L1 norm is two. So in our case, the case we considered, we are actually uh, have the possibility of this asymptotic uh, to be there. And this is exactly what we see. Uh, in order to confirm this, we need a, a numerical way to handle uh, some singular points. And these can be found in a in bifurc in numerical uh, technique for bifurcation theory in dynamical system. This is a nice uh, review of various methods that you can find. And the one that we chose to use is called pseudo arc length continuation, which is very easy to implement. Yeah, I understand. I'll be very quick, very, very quick. Um, uh, essentially, it amounts to true, instead of having epsilon to be considered as, as a function of R, I consider TBA solution to be pairs of a function and R, depending on an external parameter. And then I can ask some various questions, which are 
is the singularity a square root? Are the modern two branches? Can we exclude more complicated behaviors? And does the solution respect what we saw before? And you can see from these plots, I will just flash as quickly as I can through these plots. You can see that you have this linear behavior which is expected and this square root behavior here. For a small theta, you have a dependence on gamma. For larger theta, uh, zero, the dependence on gamma essentially disappears in this way. And here you see the uh, plots against the fit uh, of the, in the blue, in the blue color is the standard asymptotic, the red is the linear asymptotic, and this is the square root. And you see that you have a perfect agreement with, uh, in, in the appropriate region with these fits. Uh, this is the function f, which controls the linear asymptotic, and we saw that the interval where this function is positive is a, a single interval, it's not a, a union of multiple intervals. And again, the dependence on gamma uh, essentially disappears as theta zero becomes larger. You can also look at the dependence of this extreme of the of this interval here as a, as a function of theta zero, and you see that for large theta zero, they relax on the line theta zero plus one. And lastly, this one is the function g, which controls the subleading to the linear asymptotic, which is actually important when r is not too large. Uh, so you can ask, answer the question that I asked before, yes, no, yes, yes. And there are many other questions. Uh, as I mentioned, g, what is the behavior of g with uh, r? This gives the subleading behavior, which is a physically, inter physically interesting question. We need to give a physical interpretation to this uh, to this other branch. Uh, analytics suggests one over R, numerics or exponential. I, this is not set to, so I won't say anymore. Uh, let me mention that in the limit gamma goes to pi over two, you obtain this functional equation here, which is formidable by itself. It's very interesting. And uh, maybe Tiago or Matte uh, or Giancarlo can say something more in the discussion on this if they want, because I have not been working too much on this, but they have. Uh, extend to similar model, for example, a liquid sign Gordon, which has an infinite number of resonances, uh, and to find out if the square root is universal or if you have other behaviors. Uh, then more rich model, models with bound state. And finally, the interesting thing, but this is a very long-term goal, is to understand uh, the relation between the existence of this turning point and the physical properties of this matrix. Now, this is a very, very complicated subject, so trying to understand the, the existence of a bifurcation or a turning point in uh, by the properties of the map, the nonlinear map uh, is extremely, it's quite uh, formidable, I would say, also for mathematician, but it's a very interesting question. So thank you very much for your attention and sorry if I went over time. Thank I, you. I apologize. Okay. Well, is there any question? Uh, Yes, maybe uh, Volodya uh, or Pedro. Pedro? Uh, who, who is the first? <laughs> oh, Volodya, oh. can you go first? Volodya, go on. Mm -hmm. no, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Stefano. Uh, yes. If, uh, since you have now a family of such deformations, can yes. you reach, uh, so. the more, more physical behavior at at large moment, uh, say the asymptotically free theories usually have log of S matrix behaving like one over theta, yes, I over theta. Oh, yeah. So Can you mean these kind of behaviors by playing with your parameters? Because, of course, the ah, so you mean TT bar deformation is corresponds to quite a crazy behavior. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. The point exactly was exactly. Let's say one of the point of this study was exactly not to consider exponential CDDs, which are crazy behavior, as you mentioned, but consider these rational ones. Mm -hmm. So, and and this this model that we studied has exactly this uh, this behavior. So you see, it's uh, uh, it's in some ways it's like having two Sinch Gordon kernels summed together. Is, uh, mm -hmm. can, you, uh -huh. can you have one over theta precisely like it is in asymptotically free sigma models? Uh, well, one over theta. In the S matrix, you mean? Yeah, having... in the S matrix. Can you? I'm not entirely sure you can. Uh... 
because in the large theta limit, these two term complexes. Yeah, it's one or theta. That yeah. would be the most generic. Between yeah, or yeah, I understand. It, it's an interesting question. I, I, I will think about it. I, I mm -hmm. don't know. At the moment, I, I cannot answer. But yes, that's interesting. I agree. Because you see, yeah. in, the, in theory, it seems like you can construct any function that any function that you want with these EDs. Maybe it's I can make a small... Yes. Okay, I'm make a small comment. You could also take an S matrix with one over theta, like Volody is asking, which will be asymptotically free, like the ON sigma model, and yes. then by a CDD, right? And then ask yeah. what will happen in that case. Then the behavior would still be one over theta because the CDD yeah. changed that behavior. And But however, you probably would expect this same type of behavior that you are seeing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Well, okay, this is something that is still need to be settled, but the suspect is that as soon as you add something like resonances that are present here, then you, you begin seeing these... Uh, what, what about crossing yes, symmetry? We have also crossed here first. Kostya? Varembo? Do you have a more precise map between parameters uh, BS and uh, operators that you had? Oh. About, okay, no, about these factors here, no. If you consider these factors here, then each one of these cinch, each one of the spin correspond to uh, the, uh, the conserved current uh, with the corresponding spin. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, and now what you can do in principle is you can take this expression, for example, just one of these CDDs, expand it in this basis, and then consider it as a sum of that. More than that, I, I don't know exactly how to relate the, this expression here to, to action flow. I know how to do it in this case, but, but in this case, it's by itself, it's too complicated. The only way I know is to pass through these phases here at the moment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I agree. This is another, another point which is worth following and trying to understand. OK. Maybe Patrick, uh, and then uh, yeah. we can move to the discussion mm -hmm. stage. Yeah, sure. So it just I may be misunderstood, but the one over theta isn't compatible. Aren't all your S matrices crossing symmetric? Yeah. So it's one of the requirements. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't think it's it's um, forbidding. So I think you can relax the the requirement. So like Pedro said, if we start with a, with an S matrix which has a one over theta no. behavior, then I believe that you can perform the same analysis and probably you will end up with the same results. Or, or at least uh, similar results. But yeah, it's more complicated because the model is more, more rich than the one we studied. Our model, our starting model are three fermions, so they are very, very similar. Okay. Well, so I had a more general one, which I was yeah. thinking for the discussion, but maybe we're just turning into the discussion anyway now. Um, okay. When you go around your square root, you're sort of assume. are you always assuming this extra state is also in the spectrum of the theory? Is this the general philosophy? Uh, sorry. Ask again when you the, so uh, you have this sort of bonus state once you've gone around the square root. Oh right? yeah, yeah. No, we are not assuming anything. So at the moment we're not assuming. We are trying to understand if this uh, this state that you, that has this, this linear behavior has a physical interpretation. Okay, so at and, the moment you don't. I was going to ask specifically that actually whether you had some physical interpretation for this. No, part. this this is one of the points that we are trying to get get a hold of at the moment. And one of the way to do that is to look at the, for example, the subleading asymptotic to see, you know, when you go to the subleading asymptotic in the standard branch, you have this uh, massive uh, particle contribution e to the minus r over square root of r. And understanding the subleading contribution here might also be an. I mean, it's not completely clear. It has to be in the spectrum, right? No, 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 at all. But there are a lot of. I mean, there are a lot of things that uh, don't make complete sense in this case. Like this seems to be a tachyon contribution or something like that. But yeah, I agree. This is, this is one of the points that we want to settle exactly the physical meaning of this. Um, or can I ask a naive question? So I'm a bit confused yeah. about what you are just now discussing with Patrick. So maybe I'm missing some some steps. So why are you interpreting these lines as an extra particle? No, no, we are not interpreting it ah, as no. an extra particle. No, the point is exactly is that we don't know what it is. Uh, uh, we saw it happening in the TBA, and it's something that seems to enter the spectrum. But the the point is exactly to 
to give an interpretation to, to this particle here? Is it the signal of an instability, for example, like a tachyon or something like that? Or, at the moment, it's not clear. I cannot say anything definite on this. It's something we are trying to understand. Okay, I can give the floor to Patrick so I can <laughs> carry on with the discussion. I, I think there is a recent paper by Derlin et al. also and that is related to ADS CFT and cutoff uh, uh, and relating this TT bar with, uh, with cutoff. I think uh, they also need to include uh, this negative, uh, so the negative branch. Uh, yeah, but are they, are they looking at the same sign? Uh, or it's the opposite sign. Well, I, I think that I, I think I, it's the, the other sign when when the ground state energy goes to a constant. Yeah, but maybe, but still, I think they need to include the both branches of the square root. Yeah, because in that case, in, in the, exact, uh, the, gra the ground state doesn't have a bran branch, yeah. cut, but all the upper, uh, all the excited state do have branches. And then in that case, there is this question whether you need to include all the branches in the spectrum or simply truncate the spectrum, and it's not entirely clear. So I don't know. I, I think for the partition function, they seem to need to include. They need to add. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I don't know whether this, this is related. Yeah, I guess it's related to Patrick's question anyway. <laughs> yeah, still it doesn't, doesn't tell you what what interpretation to give to these, uh, to these states. Yeah. Okay, well, does Costia have a question? I can see. I'm sort of taking over Roberto's role here. <laughs> <laughs> then we can go back to Evgeny's, uh, see if there are questions for him. But Costia, did you have a question? I think the answer might be no, the hand has just disappeared. Uh, no. I have a small question to, to Genia. Uh, okay, are there any more? Maybe while um, Stefano's slides are... Oh, now they've gone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, well, we can do both. So, so yes, Ivan, fire away, please. Uh, so, um, uh, Genia, uh, yeah. when you compared the, uh, the principal chiral field and the sequel to one string theory, uh, so why, uh, why don't you use... Um, uh, well, there are several uh, models of uh, sequel to one string theory, and uh, uh, one of them is exactly uh, random services mapped. I mean, living on a Dinkin diagram. So the target space, is, the, the target space is exactly uh, this discrete Dinkin diagram. Why don't you try to compare with this model? So I saw this kernel in uh, in your talk, which is uh, literally the same uh, that appeared in um, in this model in the two point correlator. Well, maybe because I, I don't know about uh, this representation. Uh, who, who wrote this paper about it? Well, there is a very old paper, uh, my paper, Strings with discrete, discrete Target Space from the year 90. Well, I simply don't know about this. Paper don't know. <laughs> my, uh, Ivan, uh, I, I used to know these papers. It will be still one plus one dimension, yes? But you say that it's very natural to compare U plus the D D D D direction. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, and you have C equals one limit also where this Dinkin diagram is long, yes? Same infinite, yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, I agree. 